examples of attacks and how SC Linux can help mitigate some of the attacks. If you just hang around, I'll just go through these slides. It will take about 10 minutes. And you'll have some flavor of uh, what you can do with the SC Linux once you have it on your system. To, I'm going to use this, uh, the paradigm of patterns to go through the attack and defense mechanisms. A pattern is a general purpose solution, a general purpose example of how things can be done. It is not specific to any particular system or example. So let's see. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. All right, phase one attacks. Let's, let's look at the buffer overflow attack. The name of the exploit is buffer overflow. The goal is to inject malicious code on the stack or uh, uh, in a server application so that uh, something running with privileges does stuff that you want to do. So the constraints on you are you've got to actually discover a buffer overflow in some kind, whatever you're trying to exploit. And then you've got to actually deliver the user input that will cause the buffer overflow. The solution steps are you know, fairly straightforward. How do you protect against this? Well, if you're an application writer, you compile with certain things. You make, you, uh, as a sysadmin, you can make the stack non-executable. You can have the no exec patch in the Linux kernel. But you can also help out with security policy where you can contain a buffer overflow attack, even if the stack is still executable and you haven't gone over to the new exec patch. What you do is you set private file types for your application. So you've got lo log files, the files that the application uses, configuration files, the executables, are all put in a different security domain. By default, nobody is allowed to execute your application. So, and your application cannot access any of the rest of the system because now your application lives in a security domain by itself. Then you add in rules that allow uh, your application to, uh, you know, run and access its own log files, write to its own log files. You don't allow it to modify the log files. You can say that your application can create a new log file, it can append to a log file. It can only read from a configuration file. So you're limiting your application's access to its own files. Um, you provide a macro, an interface, so that other people can be allowed to run your executable. If you don't do that, then you're, well, there's no point in having this on the system because nobody, nobody will be able to run it. If you do this, if your application is compromised, nothing else can be affected because your application does not have any rights to access any other file on the system. It can read its configuration files, but it can't write to them, so it cannot uh, even you know, affect itself on the next time it runs. It, if it can only append to log files, the uh, hacker, the, the person who has broken in cannot uh, erase all logs of the intrusion. And uh, nobody else will be able to run your uh, application unless you have given them explicit permissions. So if somebody, some other application is compromised, they won't be able to fire off your application and access the resources. Okay. All right, uh, let me, I think I've got that. Okay. Let, me, let me answer this and if I have missed something that you needed to ask, I'll come back. The question being asked was, uh, what does it take 
Does it only have to be done once for an application? Say, take Apache. What does it take to write a policy for Apache? Uh, configuration files, log files, etc. Well, the first thing you do is somebody who's writing policy, you put Apache, the executable in its own domain. You try to run it in permissive mode, and SC Linux will spit out all kinds of warnings that, hey, Apache tried to access that config file. You look at it, if it feels right, you write down that policy, policy rule. Uh, you can, there are mechanisms in place which might help automate part of this. Look at what kind of uh, error messages are emitted, apply heuristics, there's a little bit of uh, an AI kind of thing thrown in and out comes a lookup polygen, apt get show polygen, P-O-L-G-E-N. And no, no, not polygen, <laughs> P-O-L-G-E-N, without the Y. So, uh, and that gives you a hint of how uh, you can get right poly. There is a guy, a researcher at IBM who is doing static scanning of source code, goes and looks through this, finds out where thing you might have uh, security events occurring, like writing to a log file, and then puts in little hooks there where you can, uh, where it will check for policy and check to see whether people are authorized or not. So if it all works out, you just, run that scanner against the source code, it's, it emits something and you massage that into a security policy. But once you have written it, every upgrade, it should not, it has not, in my experience, I've written an Apache security policy and newer versions of Apache don't require changes. Uh, most upstreams right now are not really into AC Linux because it's not deployed widely enough for them to be able to, to want to spend that kind of time. So for the near term, pushing policy upstream while it is desirable is not likely to be realistic. However, you don't really need that fine-grained knowledge about the internals of the uh, application because you just let the application run, see what AC Linux doesn't like about it, and then you can you have at least something to go on. You still need to go and look and see if the application needs to be doing that. But at least now you know what you should be looking for. I wasn't aware that we were recording, but I will do so now. This is the next little thing. I found this a really interesting exploit. There were people who were, this is actually a two level exploit. Somebody found a vulnerability in uh, internet information server. They infected that and they set it up so that when Internet Inf uh, Explorer came to it, it was given a JavaScript snippet to run. The Java snippet, uh, JavaScript snippet caused Internet Explorer to go to a another website and download something from there and execute it. The second website, of course, was the hacker's website. What was downloaded was a keylogger. And everything that was typed in into Internet Explorer from that point on was logged and sent over to the cracker. This, of course, won't be possible if we are, uh, the, they were using SE Linux because a web browser wouldn't be able to run a downloaded keylogger because it's not authorized to. The deny by default helps us here. The web browser would most likely not be able to even send data to a 
site like that because the information flow path would be prohibited. The information is not coming from the user's keyboard, it's coming from the key logger and going across that, which is not permitted. So the policy that we will create would to create a sandbox, not just for the web server, but for the web browser, restrict access to local files. For example, my Firefox should not be able to read my GPG keys. It should not be able to execute any random binary. And outgoing network connection should only be possible uh, say if the key, they modify the key logger to send the data directly, it shouldn't be allowed to talk to the network because outgoing network connection should also be restricted. So what if uh, instead of running a key logger, the, the uh, browser gets piggybacked with a buffer overflow, so it's the same binary uh, talking back to the network? A security policy can't protect you against everything. So yes, if, the, if there was a two-level exploit in which first they exploited the web server, and then they came back and found an exploit in the browser that you are using, then anything that the browser has access to could be disclosed to uh, unknown locations. Uh, my tip for that is don't run Internet Explorer. <laughs> you can't do everything in a security policy. It just makes harder to crack your box. Oh, the log file. Once it's a, a, a cracker is in, one of the things that they need to do is erase all evidence that they were there, especially if they want to keep control of your box over extended periods of time. So this involves things like wiping out all audit trails and logs must be erased and traces of the erasure itself must be erased, which be, generally means you look at etc. syslog.conf and find out where the log files are and then you uh, edit all the relevant files, and then you edit UTMP, WTMP, last log to show, erase all evidence that you ever logged in. And then finally you go in and you edit the shell history files to erase all evidence that you did this. With SA Linux, what you do is every, you set up a general, this is a pattern that every application which has log files should follow. This is kind of a best practices thing. We need to protect the log files, but we also need to allow backups to be made of the log files. So every f uh, application provides the interface to read and delete log files uh, in the security policy. The application can create and append to the log file, but, but the application itself cannot delete or change a log file log event that is already in the file. So even if the application has been taken over, you can't go back and say, oh, uh, edit and refurbish the log files. There are some applications that can read the log file, but they won't be able to write to it. A special role, a special user is required who can modify and delete log files. If you've got, if, if no application can ever be in that special domain where they're allowed to read and modify and delete log files, then no automated attack can uh, uh, compromise the log files. You need a human to come in, take a role, and run VI as themselves in order for log files to be changed. Log rotation uh, is split up into two parts. The first part is the last particular log file in a sequence is deleted. 
then normal log rotate runs, and now it finds that the last file is not there, so say log.6 was deleted by the special application. Log.5 can now be moved to log.6, etc., etc. So log rotate can still continue to work as long as it runs after the log scrubbing utility. There are examples of log scrubbing. It's a simple script. You just run it before log rotate. It reads the files, finds out which ones are going to be rotated, and make sure that the oldest one is deleted. Or better, you make sure that the oldest one is moved to a separate directory there that is, and only deleted from that other directory, say, once a month. If you're moving the last file, you can you know, put it in a new file in subdirectory based on date. So there are ways to allow you to do this and still allow log rotation to work. Complicated, yes, but then security is not easy. Which is why I spent so much time trying to scare the living daylights out of all of you about how bad the situation is out there. And it is bad. Any questions, comments? Um, at the hack lab, I can, uh, I can pull up a example I can write up a little uh, SLinux policy for, say, module foo that, and explain what I'm doing in that policy so that people can have an idea of what uh, SLinux policy writing feels like. Okay. Thank you guys for staying for this part.